you're seeing. Uh, we're just a few days past the, the, the first uh, uh, pod, podcast or you know, what we covered, but so much stuff has happened since then. Um, we're back for another round. So. Yeah. Four okay. days. Probably like four million breakthroughs or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, like, so where we left off was, uh, you know, um, after GPT-4 got released and, you know, the very next day, yep. you know, we, we caught up here in the studio talking about all the applications and then Microsoft just announced straight after we had the pod that they're going to be rolling it out across all their Office 365 suite. So this is going to be called Business Chat so across Teams. Wow. Word, Excel, PowerPoint. We knew they were going to do it, but we didn't know they were going to do it this fast. So. I mean, this is this is like capitalism talking, right? Yeah. yeah, they no no one wants to lose. That's the thing. No one wants to lose. That's right. So, this is just where, like, I don't want to say they're throwing caution to the wind, but hmm. uh, it's like if it's it's the it's under the. Is under the guise of if we don't do it, mm. they're gonna do it. Yeah, and that was the big problem with the with the nuclear um, oh, era with the atomic yeah. race. Yeah, you know, if we don't test the bomb, they will test the bomb. <laughs> and the bomb got tested, mm. even if there was speculation that the chain reaction will keep going and mm. blow up the whole planet. We tested it anyway. Yeah, and they got rid of the AI ethics people, right? And it's like, hey, you're telling us this might blow up? Okay, no, that's all right. Well, what alarm? Just turn it off. But Google did put on a red alert on this, right? So they, yeah. on the same day, we were saying, you know, this is might not be the best marketing strategy, but they they announced, you know, Google Bard equivalent for their market uh, for their workplace. So it's definitely this is now a race to the bottom. Yeah, and to to every sense of the word, I mean. In terms of, you know, availability, in terms mm. of, you know, lack of ethics, right? But also in terms of the cost. So you just saw, you know, just yesterday, I think. So Stanford using Facebook, the Meta, uh, the Llama model, right? Yes. You know, we said Llama. that got, you know, basically put on 4chan as a torrent. Now everyone has it, including the weights. Yes, the weights got leaked. The weights got leaked. And so the 7 billion parameter model, the lowest mm. one, was used by Stanford to then be trained using Da Vinci three. You know, 3, right? So yeah. that's like GPT 3.5, using that to then essentially create a model that performs just as well as chat GPT 3.5. And you can run it on a VPS. You can <laughs> yeah. run it on, you can run it on a, power, on a Surface Pro. Yeah, yeah, a MacBook Air M2 chip, but you can probably, they're, they're building one that's embedded in a browser. So imagine just having it available through your Chrome browser or an Edge browser. Oh my God. This and that's gonna... localized. So yes. not even, you know, requiring something like a Bing chat that sits in the browser, but still cloud-based and using Azure. It's I just mean, sitting there on your laptop. You can, <laughs> you can, you can train it to do what else, you know, you can, you can pass it all of the medical literature. You mm. can pass it the tax code. Mm. You can do <laughs> just. There's just so much stuff now. Yeah, they're using that for, for tax, I mean, at work already, right? So they're, they're just thinking every single possibility right now as your co-pilot. So they're calling this as your co-pilot. It's meant to be, you're not, you're meant yeah. to be the, the main pilot, right? And the AI is meant to, you know, be there to help you and, you know, provide very some smart, input. Very, very smart. But guess what? You're training it the whole time. You're training your co-pilot to eventually be the main pilot. You know what I love? Yeah. I love how, like, imagine if you were bringing out an AI mm. and, and the people say, okay, what is it? The regulatory people were coming down and they said, what is it? <laughs> what is the most harmless thing you could say? <laughs> I think instead of saying Skynet or whatever, <laughs> just, say Skynet. <laughs> just say it's like, I don't know, it's a machine that just predicts the next word in the sentence. Yeah, it's clippy. It's a real yeah. clippy. And then they're like, oh, okay, that's all it does. Let's, yeah. let's just get it out there. It's <laughs> all right. It's clippy. Because if you say it's like a, a, an artificial brain that mm. can, is potentially sentient, they'll be like, okay, yeah. hands up. Let's or, get. 
off you go to jail. That's it. <laughs> or turn the entire world and everything in the universe into paper clips. You know, like that's the whole super intelligence <laughs> that posture. Gosh. Uh, but do you how, like imagine trying to regulate this, right? So you know they had the whole big tech, you know, Senate inquiry process, mm. and they had Mark Zuckerberg in the question box asking him. So so how does oh, Facebook yeah. make money? And Mark was like, so we, we sell ads. Like that's the level of like education and sophistication you're dealing with, you know, with lawmakers in terms of, you know, when they're really just full-time politicians, they're just yeah, dealing with some, the constituency. And it's until, fails. yeah, the constituency is educated enough to actually ask what it is that they want regulated. We're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, we, we had a few ideas, didn't we? Mm. I mean, mm. um, I mean, the, the, there was some stuff that I wrote down as well, just off the top of my head mm. and I sent, sent it to you. I mean, I don't know. I just think that it really needs to catch up. This, this sort of thing needs to happen like before it starts to get serious. Cause right now it's as I think, um, Sam Altman. Yeah. Said, um, you know, now is a good time to get it out there while it's relatively harmless <laughs> and get people to get used to it and know what to expect rather than to beef it up and get mm. it to a stage where it's just panic mode. Mm. Um, I think that's, that's. <laughs> the cat's out. I mean, the, if if you're going to get the cat out of the bag, you might yeah. as well do it early. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then now we have time now, now, now we have to move forward now. Now it's not just a hypothetical in the future thing. Yeah. It's like, we got to figure out what to do because it's, it's the it's llama's out of the, the bag. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cat's out of the bag. The llama's out of the bag. It's on a <laughs> Lang Chang. You know, imagine if, uh, you know, something like GPD-4 use say the Bitcoin blockchain as a hash reference for its memories. So you could have like infinite tokens. <laughs> like, you know, that's, this is the sort of stuff that Lang Chang is probably going to be building around. So, you know, you can have interoperability around different models, but also infinite memory and in how you sort of piece all that together. And if you put that, that onto the blockchain, say a Bitcoin blockchain or Ethereum, something that references to a distributed I, false distrib Yeah. I mean, that, that is, I think, I think, I think that's, maybe there'll be a problem with lag yeah. with that, but like yes, torrent. you're right. Could be like torrent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean that, but memory and SSDs and NVMEs, mm. they're so comparably cheap now mm. to get terabytes of it. Filecoin. Yeah. Filecoin, yeah. IPFS, all of that. So, I mean, I mean, now I was even provisioning a server just the other day mm. and I could get 400 gigabytes of SSD, mm. not NVMe, SSD yeah. level. For eight bucks US a month. Wow. But that includes a four core CPU wow. and eight gigabytes of RAM. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, put that onto Google Colab, right? Like, that's pretty much just sorted. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, Sam Altman was like, you know, our backstop. <laughs> yeah. That, that term's become popular since the whole world's melting down financially as well. But that there's a backstop for super intelligent AI if they see a risk, right? Because in the paper for GPT-4, like even though it wasn't very open, they did say, you know, it was testing various things in which potentially the super intelligence might emerge. It might potentially escape. And, you know, one of the examples was that it would try to get the help of a human to pass the, I am not a robot button through, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> Like a mechanical Turk type of exercise, <laughs> right? But they were, said, they were saying that if it did manage to find a way or try to start tricking people into giving it internet access and allowing it to make copies of itself on the internet and distribute itself in the world, in the open web, that there would be a failsafe or backstop, which yeah. is to unplug everything. <laughs> so a kill switch engineer <laughs> well then, uh, if it was that simple, uh, why haven't we eradicated all the computer viruses out there? Yeah, exactly. 
exactly. And what was Skynet in Terminator Three? Uh, <laughs> it was a it was a lady, wasn't it? No, I don't know. <laughs> it was an artificial holographic lady. No, 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 that was the that's the Terminator. Like Skynet itself was an AI, and it was actually initially um a program oh, used by the U.S. Defense I'm for the, the uh, I'm operating getting... system of yeah, all its sorry. military hardware. I was getting Red, Resident Evil mixed up. That's it. Red, Red, Red Queen. Red Queen. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I mixed up my sci-fi's. Uh, all those uh, Contagion type movies, right? We were talking about The Last of Us last time. So it's like, yeah. yeah, I need to see that when I have time. It's but very good. I but have yeah, to... Kill Switch engineer. So um, The Last of Us, you know, it's cordyceps. So it's um, instead of say some Resident Evil virus, it's actually fungus. The fungus that um, you know we we eat mushrooms and things like that. The stuff that uh, we try to get rid of, you know, if you ever get a fungal infection, <laughs> right? But oh. fungus don't survive in humans because of our body temperature, right? So in the Last of Us, in the sci-fi game, that they the story behind that is that because of global warming, the fungus started to evolve and essentially you know adapt to warmer temperatures, you know, essentially be able to grow in humans. And what happened is actually um, in real life, some fungus actually can infect ants and turn them into zombie-like creatures. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> this I, is um, this is that there is there is something that we could bridge to AI in a sense, right? Because you know, I'm paying for GPT four, and I'm using it in everything I do except you know sensitive work-related subjects. But if it's learning from me and I'm relying on it and it's sort of in a sense infected how I think and we have this sort of symbiosis, um, you know, when will I start to just start to follow the instructions of the AI as opposed to having any sort of real thoughts, right? That is, yeah, there's a lot of things to think about. I mean, I think that the, um, the, the possibility of the AI actually wanting itself to like leave is very low. Mm. I think that it's more likely that, you know, bad actors, bad players out there, like mm. other humans. Yeah, that's more likely. That's, that's going to be the, the linchpin. I mean. Other nation states. Yes. China and Russia well, and. Yeah. Vladimir Yugoslavia. Putin, right? He was like, whoever controls or, you know. Yeah. Gets some emergency of AI you know, can take over the world. And it's. And so, yeah, like you said, this arms race, you know, Baidu, you know, they launched their oh, the search LLM, Bernie, search. right? It's, it's um, better if you're using Chinese, of course, but they didn't make that open. <laughs> they won't, they're not going <laughs> to make that not. open source. <laughs> um, but Lama, Lama and Dalai and uh, yeah. Alpaca. Alpaca on Lama and Da Vinci, but yeah, not open AI. Closed AI. You've got the weights now. Mm. Well, technically. Well, um, torrent. I want to see, you know, how all of this sort of landscape starts to change because still these large language models rely on, you know, training it on a large data set, right? So they're trying to make those data sets smaller and smaller because they're increasing the relevancy. The but for real sort of, you know, emergent conscious sort of decision, uh, evolution of, you know, this theory of mind and, how real intelligence comes about is that we don't we don't have to train it on a large data set, right? That's right, because like us, mm. like we are quite we we have a very small general mm. understanding of the world, but then mm. we're very specialized in one area. Like someone will be a doctor, a dentist, a, mm. a, a a woodworker, or whatever. So we so you could imagine an AI with a very basic rudimentary understanding of the world and then specialize in mm. neuroscience, making pizza, whatever it is, yeah. you know, yeah. and that would be so much more manageable. And maybe well, that's you where do the proprietary have a... data will come in. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if, um, if you say in radiology, they already do that with, you know, the actual health data of x-ray scans, mm. you know, See, that MRIs. Might be, it might be the big backflip. It's like everyone's thinking, oh, we've got all these narrow AIs. Why don't we have a general AI? Mm. And then as we're approaching the general AI, we go, oh, you know what? We, <laughs> it's easier just to make some narrow AI. Well, I think that if the general AI had access to all that data, it actually would get better because it would be able to do that transfer oh, learning yes. and apply that. So yes. take one specialist field, which is why we don't have, you know, we could have more innovation if more specialists collaborated. Yes. Right? 
because That's they're in their true. silos. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the challenge is, like you say, like it's, it's that sort of the deep knowledge that is privileged data and that's not open in the internet. So this is why the, the large language models haven't got to that level of expertise yet. But once the enterprises start using it, right, using their in, own instance on Azure, opening that up to their own private data sets they're hosting on a SQL database, well, and they would use it because it's now yeah. a business. It's That's for right. making money. Yeah. And they pile it for everything, it. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is um one other point was, you know, if we if you talked about okay, so what's missing in this whole evolutionary step of um developments in these large language models? Well, as humans, we do have something that's almost resembles like a large language model pre trained. And it's there in our DNA, like those basic instincts, the reptilian brain we talked about last time, mm. you know, basic motor functions, then the mammalian brain about, you know, emotions and all of that sort of interactions in a societal, you know, yes. sort of uh, in, a, in a, the monkey brain equivalent. So all of that is actually pre-trained, right? That's baked into our DNA. Right. Because and we don't actually need to, you know, ex experience that. Because we sort of feel like, you know, as soon as we open ourselves up, there's babies, right? You see, yes. okay, you have, you basically imprint on who's your mum, who's your dad, yes, or who's your both, right? You know, I, it's like, this is what's probably an element of LLM, but it's not all of it, right? I got to say, as you were saying that just now, hmm. it, and as you were talking about the, 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 the personality and the, the instincts, I immediately thought of... You know, uh, a psychopath has down-regulated mm. emotional centers. Yeah. So what would a large language model be if it didn't have mm. any emotions? Yeah. yeah would yeah. it be, I mean, a psychopath is, I saw um, that, uh, some scene of um, that movie, The Jackal with, uh, Bruce Willis. Jackal. Yeah. That's yeah, that was a really nice. Movie. Mm. And there was a scene where he just kills him in cold blood mm. and doesn't even, that's right. not even a second thought, but that's because he's psychopathic and yeah. all of his emotional centers that's are right. down regulated. Something's missing, right? Yeah, yeah. Like he could do that without any second thought. Yep. And the thing is, if you have, I mean, we have to think about it, you know, if, if, if an AI mm. can think that way too, without yeah. any emotional consequences. <laughs> Pretty misaligned right there. <laughs> we'll, we have a very intelligent electronic psychopath potentially. Yeah, that's right. And just, you know, don't put it into like a dog with a gun on it, right? You know, those robot dogs with like <laughs> the unitree ones with the machine guns that are actually shipping now into the military. Um, like. <laughs> see, this is not going to work. Um, you yeah, know, reactionary the, law. Bots. We need to preemptively, hmm. we have to figure this out before the fact. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, you can't just make the car mm. and have people smash into buildings and other cars and mm. a thousand deaths later go, oh, maybe we should, <laughs> oh, seat belts. Yeah. And then the car industry is like, no, no, we don't mm. need that. Our cars are safe. <laughs> 20 well, this, years later, they put it in. Yeah. Now, this is, this is exactly sort of where we need that alignment, right? So the co-pilot is meant to work alongside you and it's meant to sort of learn from your interactions. So in a sense, it sort of gets a sense of what you're trying to achieve, but it's missing the whole, you know, social element. So what if the AI was starting to be trained, say through augmented reality glasses, right? So you're, it's, it's doing eye tracking, it's looking at the things. So it's trying to estimate what you're thinking yes. and it's overlaying that relevant information that you would otherwise have done yourself. And the more that you do those actions, it's sort of, you know, does that reinforcement learning with that human feedback into the better suggestions, recommendations it would do. Say, you know, you're looking at your computer yes. just for work and <laughs> you start opening up an email and it starts suggesting the response. And as you type, you're pretty much validating it or you're just saying you autocomplete. I think that may, right. there might be some hesitation with that. Because mm. I have a feeling a lot of people don't work that much. <laughs> yes yeah yeah that's right say they've if they had to work right <laughs> <laughs> like they'd turn it on and they would switch it off 
So I imagine it will be yeah, on yeah, for about yeah. an hour a day. Yeah. Say it was by Apple says, you know, they, they say everything is done on device because, you know, you can run those alpacas on device. Oh, yeah. Right. So it's not even connected to the internet. And, you know, say this is your personal digital agent. It, it's almost like your lawyer, your attorney, your, uh, um, you know, bodyguard, you know, against the other sort of AIs out there who are trying to, you know, breach your data and all those sort of things. So it's, it's like your protector. And because it's built up that relationship with you, you entrust it with everything yeah. that you do. Your real co-pilot in life, right? So your partner in crime. And so as it gets better and trained like that, that's how you can probably align this particular AI to you. And should you choose right. to, you can opt in to then, you know, sync those learnings to a collective, you know, to monetize that, right? In a private yes. and secure way. And so this might be a way where, you know, you were saying, how do we, you know, make sure this transition for the human skills workforce mm -hmm. to be as aligned and as sort of less shaky, right? Less, less violent as possible. Yeah. Well, you want the, um, the income distribution mm. to be relatively unaffected. Yeah. At least in the beginning. Yeah. And you want the cooperation of the people. Mm. This is how you've got to be able to fund a UBI, right? So open AI's mission is to fund a UBI, but that takes monetization of what they've got, which is the closed AI. And so in order to do that, you should be rewarded, you know, yes. for all that training you've done for your AI. Yes. And, right? and the UBI is kind of, it has a very, uh, what do you call it? It's like that it's, 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 I know it's anti-capitalist in the, in a sense <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's, you don't want to give people handouts and a lot of people won't, don't like free handouts, <laughs> but I mean, it is one way to solve it, mm. but then how do you keep people going to work mm. and keeping their professions up? Yeah. Well, this is what um Andrew, you know, Andrew Yang, right? Back in the Yang yeah. gang days, he's yeah. back. He's running uh, with his Ford party for the 2024 presidential election. I don't know why he, I know he gave up because he had to back, uh, was it Bernie? Yeah. I mean, uh, he had to back Biden, right? In the end. And then Bernie just, anyway. Oh, he was a fan of Bernie. But I think, yeah, he ended up just backing Biden because that was sort of the, mm. the most likely winner of the, the race for, you know, on the d Democrat side. But he lost momentum um, because I think we just didn't really realize what was going to happen to us. Like if he ran today on the ticket of automation, AI and automation, right, he would get a lot more traction, which is, he's, mm. is happening right now with Bill Maher on the TV show just this past weekend. And yeah. You know, I think during COVID when he ran, right, he could have just been running on the fact that we could be giving stimulus checks at the time, right? And that's yeah. in a form almost like a UBI and people would understand what that means because everyone gets it, right? It's yes. everyone gets a stimmy check rather than only those that are seeking work and, are, you know, unemployed, they yes. get it. And it takes away that stigma because we're all in this together. Actually, that brings up a good point. Mm -hmm. So it's like you might... I mean, with AI, we have the, it seems like we, we are going to have the opportunity to have our cake and eat it too. Mm. So we, we have so much potential economic output mm. compared to the population. And mm. as that economic output grows, you could have the UBI mm. for people that just don't care about work. And then, but for all those people who are incentivized to mm. just, and they just, they just want to, to get out there and work, they can do that. Yeah. And it's a choice. Be, there'll be options. That's right. There'll be options. Like you could choose to continue to do what you were doing, right? Yeah. You know, even though an AI is doing it already, it doesn't stop you from doing it. It's just like, you yeah. know, painting artwork just because you can put into mid journey or stable diffusion or Dali 2 to do it for you. It doesn't stop you from actually painting it, right? Yeah. And it's just like riding horses now these days. They do it as a hobby as opposed to a necessity. And, you know, right. this is, this is basically what people really need to come to mind because it's kind of like the Star Trek scenario where in a future where we are abundant in all of the resources and all of the things that we could humanly want and you know what's there more to do right so they had this episode where there was a rich guy you know he had been you know cryopreserved and you know woken in the future when mm -hmm. Star Trek, you know, everyone had eliminated scarcity. So it's a post-scarcity society. And he's like, you know, I'm a big shot uh, lawyer from a law firm and I know that I still have a lot of money, 
and you know I'll, I'll, I'll continue to use my power over you and people are like what, what why why are you doing this right and then after a while and, and getting to understand how society's evolved now to a post-scarcity world he, he's like well what what do i do to actually spend the time right and you know the basically uh the, he was told that you're meant to just enrich yourself right enrich yourself and really basically do what makes you feel good like this is this is ult the ultimate human like the final human form right it's like for us to be free from the need to couple work from income so that decoupling where ai can provide all the goods and services that we could humanly need you know before we merge with it and upload our brain and you know basically beam ourselves all throughout the universe <laughs> that's when it's um that's what it's meant to be about Um, yeah this is the i sometimes think these thoughts and sometimes we're talking to you sometimes talking to anaraj jonathan Mm. and i get that moment of wait a minute we just getting too crazy (laughs) and i always i I developed this habit of snapping myself i think a comeback Come back. <laughs> yeah, back and to reality. Back to Whoop, reality. The girl's gravity. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it does go gravity. Like we go. So it's like, I, I would wonder as a kid, you know, when you look up at the universe, you know, why, why is all that stuff out there? Even if, if say you were say religious and you would say, you know, why did God put all this stuff up there? Mm. And now it's kind of like, oh yeah. Okay. I can actually explore it's, uh, it. Yeah, it's it's actually there for us to to go and check out. And yeah, I mean, it, it really sort of so so it's ever since how how we've been raised, right, mm. is that we've almost chosen money to be a religion because we've believed in that fact that money is, of course, w- with the means of getting the resources, the goods and services that you've ever wanted, right, and so the entire life goals have been aligned towards money. And, you know, I guess some yes. people worship it. You know, if you think about Wall Street and capitalism, right? They, mm. they do the ceremonies of ringing that bell, of doing an IPO is like going to heaven, of, you yes. know, like <laughs> basically um, With a you spec know, have these charts that they read, kind of like, yeah. you know, doing all the superstitious things. Oh, you know, if it goes up eight times, it might go down. And if it goes up again, then you're in a bull run. <laughs> and like, there's all this sort of like religious ceremony about it. And right now we're in the midst of so many things happening that's disrupting our entire view of the world and the universe and the multiverse, right? Because one, we're seeing what's happening in the US financial markets right now, that people are starting to question whether the US dollar is the real God that they actually should have been believing in this whole time. Well, because 80, what's been happening? 80 trillion just... Yeah. Is it 80 trillion? Something like 40 trillion. 40 yeah. trillion. Oh, 40 trillion dollars of bonds. Um, so oh. so w- w- let's just get everyone up to speed on what's been happening, right? So people yeah. heard about the crypto markets, right? They, because they thought crypto was a scam with FTX imploding. We talked about this in our last pod a couple of times yep. ago. And they said, okay, so if crypto is a scam, then, you know, we should just put our money back into the US dollar because tech, you know, that's had its run. Now that the interest rates are rising, you know, the future value, the present value of money, right, is worth more <laughs> than yeah. right now, right? I want my returns right now than into the future. Well, when, so when, the- when that stuff goes up, I, I tend to what? Look at commodities, mm. gold, gold, et cetera. Yeah. Is that what you... Yeah. Well, like, well, so yes, I mean, so they, they went back to their banks. They went back to fiat money because mm-hmm. they, they realized that they thought that, you know, okay, that's what was real for them. Yeah. But little did they realize that if they studied cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, right, and the whole reason why Bitcoin came about after the last global financial crisis, <laughs> the last GFC right, in yes. 2008, which is why Bitcoin was invented in the first place, was that we could no longer trust the banking system, the US fractional reserve, 
as soon as they decoupled from, from gold gold from the Bretton Woods system and you know as soon as they realized that the US dollar might not be the reserve currency going forward which you know after World War 1 and towards World War 2 was when the US really established themselves as that reserve currency mm. so they can't just print more of it more of it and they do. And, and make it okay <laughs> But oh, yeah, they are printing yeah, more yeah. of it, right? Because what's happened recently, so you had, you know, Silvergate collapse, which is a mm -hmm. crypto bank. Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley Bank yeah. was the next to fall. And people thought, oh, this is a crypto and tech issue, right? Let's blame it on the crypto and tech bros. But it turns out that Silicon Valley Bank went down because it had invested into these 10-year long-term treasury bonds. These Mortgage-backed securities, right? When and were they of, going to uh, mature? When 10 they, years, exactly. In 10 years. in 10 years' time. Right. So during, during COVID, you know, interest rates were zero because, mm -hmm. you know, that was a stimulus that the government wanted to make sure the economy, when it was shut down, could still continue to function and grow. Yes. Right. And that's you when would. you had all this sort of... You had to. You know, pumps in the crypto and tech. But... You know, now that they realize that the inflation is catching on, right? All of that money had to go somewhere mm. when the doors opened and it was inflating the economy. They went from 0% interest rates to 5% in the US. But guess what? Those 10 year mortgage bonds that were bought by all the banks during COVID, right? Thinking that that was the best return that they could get, pretty much free money, right? It's risk free. 1.5% max <laughs> versus 0%, better than nothing, right? Going and Silicon train. Valley Bank, you know, because they were growing so fast, because they were working with a lot of startups, they got those startups to put their deposits, the funding that they had raised back into the banks. And, you know, they had a great relationship there. They also lent out to startups as well. So they were pretty much a Ponzi in a sense, but I guess that's the US fiat reserve currency anyway, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, because of that huge jump in interest rates, these banks, these regional banks, right? So they're, mm. they're not like the too big to fail banks. These regional yep. banks couldn't liquidate those 10-year treasury bonds in time to essentially meet the needs of their depositors. Now, as yep. soon as the depositors, like the startups, like Peter Thiel, like yeah. from, you know, basically all the sort of uh, VCs, as soon as they realized that Silicon Valley Bank was in trouble because of these treasuries, right? They want out. They were like, get your money out because there's nothing really for them to lose. Like, I mean... So they couldn't manage the run. Exactly. Well, and there was no downside for taking your money out and putting it into another bank, right? Yeah, so they, you might as well just do that. It was just a paper. Well, the thing with um, um, the... Uh, I mean, that, that also seems to be happening to Afterpay and mm. ZipPay. Mm. So they were, they, they really went like, got huge evaluations during COVID, 0% or well, close to 0% interest rate yeah. and good business model, you know, uh, pay something over three months. Mm. But then now that the interest rates are, are, are going up. Mm. So what are they, 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 they someone buys something on eBay for 500 for say $600, mm. it splits it into three payments of 200. Mm. But in the meantime, they have to pay the, the person who just sold it. Yeah. So they borrow, which used to be fine because it was very low interest rate, but now their margin is nothing. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, like I think being in crypto also teaches you a lot about how money works, right? Because, okay, you, for say, you know, cryptocurrency, yeah. you learn about what's the max supply, right? Bitcoin, it's 21 million. There's never going to be ever more than 21 million Bitcoins. Whereas with fiat currency, right, they could continue uh, to print that. Yeah. They have a monetary policy that could, is, is so delayed, right? So in terms of moving interest rates up or down, as determined by the Federal Reserve and the respective reserve banks across all the other jurisdictions. They have to wait for the data to come in, right? They assess that in their monthly meeting, and then they move up the gear in these sort of incremental steps, right? 25 basis points, 50 mm. basis points, 75 basis points, if they're really 
they wanted to do a U-turn on the economy. It's like the RBA. It's like the RBA, right? It really rug pulled us on that one. <laughs> Saying with well, the forward guidance as well that we won't raise rates yeah, for another they, year they, or so, they, 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 two yeah. years. And, and so, then, but then they had to because yeah, yeah, because of inflation, they caught yeah. really caught up to them. They thought it was transitory. It wasn't mm. transitory. Mm. There was a lot of money flooding into the market. So Silicon Valley Bank, they you know just like the other regional banks, they relied on the forward guidance by the Federal Reserve that the interest rate would stay low. Yep, they bought those Treasury bonds that was sold by the reserve as part of that stimulus, right? The quantitative easing that was happening. Quantitative easing, yes. And then rates went up 5%. So uh, all those bonds that they bought, uh, you know, basically worth 10% less, right? Rel relatively speaking, eight to 10% less. And these are, these are unrealized losses and they don't need to be put as unrealized losses on the balance sheet because they could just hold them to maturity. So regional banks don't need to basically mark to market these instruments. Mm. And so, you know, if there was a secondary market, like say security, securitized version of these bonds, then maybe you could just pass that risk down to the, to the public markets, right? As an ETF or something like that. This is kind of what, like what happened to FTX. There well, was like a, a whistle and they said, oh, this is not. Yeah. FTX uh, is different. Yeah. It's um, cause FTX isn't a bank. They, oh, yeah, they should but, have held everything one for one. Right? Yes, but mm. the reason why everyone just started pulling out was mm. because there was CZ. no confidence. Yeah, yeah CZ was like, CZ hang on a second, something smells fishy. You know, why? Which is basically the same as, as, the, as with the banks, with their bonds uh, and, and the confidence. That's right. Yeah. And what triggered, what made um, Silicon Valley Bank fishy was that it wanted to raise $2 billion to cover their shortfalls on their balance sheet. They thought that, you know, they wouldn't be able to cover their assets and liabilities because some of their liabilities have been written down. And also because of rising interest rates, they weren't making as much money as they should be on those instruments. And so they, they needed to liquidate some of their treasury bonds and make a loss, a $1.8 billion loss on selling those treasury bonds. And they had to raise $2 billion to fill in that hole. And as soon as Silicon Valley realized, you know, all the VCs realize that this bank is making a loss on treasury bonds. Why do they need to sell money? They must be low in cash to serve the depositors. So they shot themselves in the foot. Yeah, that's the lack of confidence. And then everyone withdrew and think about, was it initially it was $42 billion withdrawn within a single day. And by the end of it, I think it was about, yeah, the majority of the customer deposits were withdrawn. And, you know, now it's sort of handed over to the FDIC, which is their, <laughs> you know, insurance for these regional banks. Yeah. And so if you had deposits more than $250,000, um, you were no longer insured. So that's why everyone was freaking out. So that was driving, you know, a f the f driving the government. Everyone was trying to push the government to ensure that the depositors were, were safe because, you know, sure, the shareholders of, Silicon Valley Bank could be wiped out. The bondholders, the corporate bondholders could be wiped out as well. That's, that's, you know, we don't want to bail them out mm. because of their financial mismanagement of locking these long-term treasury bonds Papers. in, uh, you know, with those customer deposits. But instead, <sighs> um, the deposits got backstopped. So the Federal Reserve set up a facility where not just Silicon Valley Bank, but also First National as well, another regional bank, could also tap into this reserve. But now they've realized that this not, is not just, you know, a couple of regional bank issue. It's all the banks. It's all a systemic the, it's issue. It's a systemic issue with oh all the gosh. banks of between now and the next three months will have this liquidity crunch where they'll be forced to sell these bonds, making a loss on them in order to meet customer deposits if there was another bank run or if there was another sort of systemic risk driving people to move their money elsewhere. So would the Federal Reserve be now thinking of how to create some liquidity for these people? That's right. So that's what exactly what they did earlier today. Oh. And so, <laughs> that's a good idea. And they're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll put in, we'll put in 25 billion, right? That's and not guess, enough. Guess how much they think it's going to be withdrawn at this stage. They need to put 500 billion. Yeah. It's, it's probably, it's shooting up 
So it's coming up to about maybe a couple of trillion. Oh. And that's pretty much reversing all of that sort of effort that they've been doing to increase interest rates to reverse the quantitative easing they've been doing since COVID. So $4 trillion was pretty much printed out during, you know, from the COVID stages. And that's going to push interest rates And they got up rid of some of it, and then now it's like more. back up again. Yeah. And guess what? It's no longer just a US Federal Reserve issue anymore because Credit Suisse, right, they've, they've been in trouble since, you know, last decade. They've been going down in terms of the shareholder value. But because of all this treasury bond issue, potentially losing their value and people losing faith in these banks, They've also had to be backstopped, and the Swiss government actually, you know, had a, had to backstop all the depositors, and then they've been essentially shotgun wedding to the other Swiss bank, UBS, in this recent announcement this morning, that uh, yeah, UBS is going to acquire Credit Suisse for three billion francs, well, three billion euros. Nothing. Yeah, it was worth seventy billion euros in two thousand and six. Credit Suisse, right? It's it's such a home. Oh my gosh! It's a it's like a you know you you know it, right? Everyone that you, you they're say buying Credit the Suisse, debt. Yeah, they're basically buying the debt. Pretty much, they're well as part of the negotiations. They're they're saying you know we don't we want to make sure that we're not on the hook for any of this toxic debt that that might be held by Credit Suisse. Um, all these ten year Treasury mortgage backed securities. We don't want to have to bear any cost to that mm. and guess what so now it's a it's a global issue because they've got switzerland involved but also all the other re, uh, all the other foreign banks right their foreign reserve banks have just gathered right so joe biden you've got canada you know all parts of europe uk oh right japan all the all the federal reserve have come together and they've established this credit swap facility because Guess what? All those foreign banks are also holding U.S. long-term treasuries. So these unrealized losses that we thought was just a U.S. regional bank issue, it's not only just also applies to the large U.S. banks, but also across the other foreign banks. And what, what this is trying to stop essentially is the foreign banks dumping the U.S. treasury bonds and making a loss and flooding the market, right? Because then we'll, that'll devalue it even yeah. more. There'll be too and much so they're supply. trying to facilitate a liquidity pool, right? In, in a crypto mm. sense, this would be a, a liquidity pool where people can swap their treasury bonds for people that want to buy it within that. So they're creating a market for it. That's, they're creating an isolated swap space yeah. that's out of sight of the it's, regular economy. That's right. It's an OTC deal to swap Is, it out. Oh, yeah, like an OTC on... Uh, on um, in crypto. Yeah, reserve to reserve, federal but reserve the to federal reserve. OTCs need to be announced. That's right. And that way it doesn't impact the market price when you sell it all out. But get this, if someone is forcing the swap of the US treasury bonds and it's the US that has to pay and they don't have the cash to pay, they're just going to print that. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're the reserve currency of the world and the U.S. bonds are they denominated in U.S. dollars, yeah. right? And so this will cause even more inflation because it's reversing all that sort of tightening, monetary tightening they've been trying to do since this inflation ever started. And so between now and the next three months is probably the shakiest part when these short-term treasuries are coming to do. So what's going to happen to all the other countries holding U.S. dollars? Are they going to go overweight or are they going to get rid of it because well, yeah. they're holding on to something that's inflating. <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what? There's a, there's a very, there's a huge game theory going on right now. So if you choose to sell, right, what are you going to sell? What are you going to get? You're, you're going to get oh, yeah. more US dollars. Or commodities. <laughs> so then more you have gold. to swap the US dollars to commodities, right? Mm. So you'll flood the market with the US dollars and that'll cause a sort of landslide in the value of the US dollars. It's going down anyway. Right. So if you, if you understand you cryptocurrency, you know exactly what I'm talking about because this is Global how liquidity pool. works, right? Mm. Global rug How pool. markets work. Market making works. And so mm. there's a game theory you want going on because you, you basically, what you, if you sell, you're saying that you no longer have faith in the US dollar and the US 
as you know the the reserve currency of the world and mm. also its dominance in the global economy. So yep. what are you going to go back to? What well, what are you going to go to? Are you going to go to China and the digital yuan? Right? So if you're a BRICS country, right? So Brazil, Russia, right? Bring bring the Amaro. India, Amaro, whatever it's called. China and South Africa. Amaro, yeah. <laughs> bring up Amaro. What's the one that was going to be uh China, uh Canada, Australia and the US? Oh, you mean UK? Oh. Orcus. Orcus. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's go. a defense pack. Yeah, that's a military oh, pack. So yeah, but also that's yeah. that's one of the things that the US is trying to make their def the deficit lower, right? Because we're going to be spending three hundred seventy oh, billion dollars US uh, Australian into these submarines, right? So that'll help their balance sheet, the US side, over ten years. But what I'm saying is that strategically, it means all those sort of countries that are aligning with the US, right? Because this is what it is. This gathering of this mm. credit swap facility is the US aligned nations and because you don't see many bricks in there, right? So they're basically trying to backstop the US economy and maintaining it as the reserve currency and its dominance in the economy. But if all this fails, this is this is the new world order we're gonna be facing. This is exactly what Ray Dalio and the principles he's been preaching and what Balaji has been very active in talking about on Twitter which is the network state. So he's been on about this all this time that when the US dollar implodes, it's Bitcoin and it's gonna be the hyper <laughs> Bitcoinization, right? Um, stage where Bitcoin could go to a million dollars because Bitcoin to US dollar, right? could be infinitely high. The Bitcoin of Bitcoin will always be one Bitcoin because there's only going to be 21 Bitcoins relative to all the stuff we have in the world. Yeah. So I think, yeah, over the next three months, I think we can probably document it and see what, what plays out, but it definitely won't be boring. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, to, I've got to check my uh, crypto wallet now. Deep. Yeah. I mean, this is the reason why Bitcoin was invented from the last GFC, Ethereum. when we lost faith in the financial system mm. of fiat. Fear of fiat. Fear of fiat. And also why transhuman coin exists for transhumanists, right? Because we want <laughs> to have a community of people, which is, you know, this whole network state philosophy of people, places, and laws, or people, land, or laws, and laws. So places and land, right? So... We need to be able to acquire land of which we can operate, and see. This is what laws we're gonna, in terms of smart contracts. We we'll have the AI AI workers doing all the all the essential stuff, mm. and we will just be buying and selling Bitcoin and land. <laughs> well, Singularity Net, right? We talked about this last time. Singularity Net is AI on chain, and Singularity DAO has already got a dyna set that algorithmically trades cryptocurrencies. So it could, you know, essentially be the liquidity provider, but also the profit maker in these markets across oh, every resource, across every currency, good or service. It's it's an ultimate arbitrage. And I don't think humans will be able to beat that AI. I mean, quants already beat them, humans, in proprietary training. If AI got access to the stock market right now and was mm -hmm. able to buy and sell stocks, yeah. it'll eventually end up with all the money. Yep. Yeah, it's like that movie, um, you know, Limitless, right? Just like a superhuman. It's not even AI. It's just like super jacked in the brain. <laughs> and Oh, I didn't, I don't, so what happened there? Yeah, so, you know, in Limitless, um, regular guy down on his luck discovers this oh, drug, right, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes his eyes bluer. <laughs> yes, and, and he, he knows how to make money on the stock market. Yeah, right. yeah, pretty much. So that'll be, you know, AI times and then times that by, you know, infinity because just keep on replicating and copying. Eventually, we'll just trade itself just for fun because <laughs> everybody else is broke from trading. Yeah, it'll become monopoly. Yeah, it'll literally, um, you know, no, no monocles. Apparently, I um, <laughs> always thought Monopoly Man had monocles, but I saw a meme about... <laughs> he had glasses. Yeah, apparently he never had. 
Yeah, that's some Inception stuff right there. <laughs>